Thanks very much. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is our efforts to, to make a new pancreas. Um, and, you know, just to set this up, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on the general field that we call tissue engineering. So there's actually this, this field that's focused on trying to make new organs, new organs, new tissues. There are a lot of injuries that people <laughs> suffer where you, you can't take a pill for a missing hand, for example. How do you actually treat things like that? So I apologize for this next picture. It's a little disturbing. So this is Voldemort who, in addition to being a, a generally displeasing sort of nasty kind of guy, he's also missing his nose. Um, I actually have pictures of, of sort of real people missing their noses and frankly didn't want to share those. But let's assume Voldemort actually was going to get treated. Well, today his best op opportunity to get treated is with this. So this is the kind of thing you might give your kids in Halloween. So this is a, a, a basically a rubber nose. I mean, and I think you can imagine that while it might help cosmetically, it's really not going to allow people to live their lives. And so a real revolution in this field has come about through engineering. And so what does that mean? So we actually want to figure out how to make things like noses and ears and other tissues by using uh, engineering principles. So these things are basically made out of living cells and materials. And so one early example of this is actually done by Jay Vacanti. This is, a, this is a, called the Vacanti mouse. So this is actually that tissue engineered ear uh, in a living animal. It was made with biodegradable polymers and after a couple weeks uh, the only thing left is really cartilage. Um, and so it's really a, a, a tremendous visual example of, of how this, this stuff is actually coming along. Um, Here's another example. Uh, this is a rabbit. And in fact, there are people today who've uh, been treated uh, with these kinds of cartilage, with skin, uh, with bone. It's not really science fiction, although it's not broadly available. But you know, this kind of stuff is, is actually happening. And so we'd like to figure out a way to, to do this kind of work for diabetes. How do you make a new pancreas? So we don't want to just make one pancreas. We'd like to make hundreds or thousands or millions. We'd like to figure out how to treat everybody. Um, and so, how do you do this? Well, at, at the end of the day, what we're talking about um, oops, is, is, is making a device that's composed of sort of two major ingredients. We've got the cells, which you've heard a lot about today, whether they're from stem cells or uh, human donors or even potentially from pigs. And then we have materials that I'm going to talk about a, a little bit later. And so, as any engineer uh, has to have a, a design plan, so what are the design criteria for a, for a new pancreas? So first, we're talking about a, a living organism. So these cells need to be able to eat. They need to stay alive. They need to breathe, just like every other cell in your body. They need to be able to do their job. So what does that mean? In this case, they need to be able to sense glucose and secrete hormones, like insulin. Um, and then finally, they need to be protected from the immune system. So um, if you have a pig cell and you put it in a person, your immune, immune system knows that's, that's not supposed to be there. And so you need to actually protect that. And so first, uh, the first point, so food and, and, air, and air. These are living, living devices. So we need to make sure they're, they're, they're able to get oxygen, they're able to get food. And in your body, um, this is basically done uh, with blood vessels. So you have all these complicated blood vessels in your body that take blood and nutrients to all the cells. Um, and so this is how we do it. Um, and believe it or not, it's actually kind of tough to make these things. And so, well, what do you do if you can't make a capillary bed or a vascular tree? Well, uh, it's actually a big problem. And, and this is actually the single biggest challenge to tissue engineering. And I thought I'd give one kind of overarching design principle. So in general, it's hard to make any living tissue past uh, a couple hundred microns. And the reason is that you've got your cells on the outside and the cells on the inside can't breathe and eat, so they start to die. So unless you can figure out how to have blood vessels, you just can't make these things that big. And so, well, if you can't make a cap capillary bed, what you can do is actually make, make them really small. So maybe instead of you know, just one big pancreas, maybe you could actually make hundreds or thousands of little teeny pancreases. 
pancreas, pancreas is not sure which is right. But um, so that's shown here. So perhaps you could actually make a whole bunch of these little spheres, and each one is doing its job measuring glucose, secreting insulin. Um, so, so, so what is the job? The job is to sense glucose, stay alive, and secrete hormones. And so um, the, the, the basic idea here is you want to wrap these living insulin-producing cells inside of a membrane that we call semi-permeable. So that's sort of a nerdy term for a, uh, basically a barrier that will let certain things in and, and certain things out. But you don't want a barrier that's going to let the cells leave. You don't want a barrier that's, that's going to let the immune system in. Um, and so that's shown here in, that, in, in the corner. That's an example of a killer T cell. So your body's immune system is pretty smart and has a lot of dangerous characters. And one of them is the, the, the killer T cell, who, whose job is basically to kill cells that are not supposed to be there. Um, and so you need to have this artificial pancreas eating, breathing, making hormones, hiding from the immune system. Um, and so that's what scientists have been trying to do. And so, so what would that look like? So it's got to be small. We mentioned that. It's got to be semi-permeable. So it's got to let certain things in and out. It's got to have a whole lot of water. So there really aren't any dry tissues in your body. There's just your skin. So this is what it looks like. It's a little ball of basically you can think about it as jello. And in this particular case, these are made from seaweed. So not this particular kind of seaweed, but inside, uh, no sesame seeds, but inside uh, seaweed is there's something called alginate, which is basically a long sugar. And so you can isolate the stuff and make something that looks kind of like jello. And you can actually put eyelets inside of this thing. And you can make little teeny spheres. There's a variety of little fabrication methods that, that people have developed to make these little teeny spheres full of cells. Uh, this picture is from Gordon Weir, who's our collaborator. And actually, back in 1980, uh, uh, Lim and Son showed that you could take uh, islet cells from a rat, put them inside these little balls, and then put them in a different rat that was diabetic, um, and actually cure it, at least for a couple days. I mean, you shouldn't be eating that even if you don't have diabetes. But, um, I mean, this is an amazing result from 30 years ago. It's a diabetic rat. You could make basically an artificial pancreas or a bunch of these things, put them in another animal, and cure it. But uh, it, it, it didn't last forever. It lasted for a few weeks. And so you know, one of the big challenges is that we have our capsules with our living cells, sensing glucose, secreting hormones, protected from the immune system. But the immune system gets smart. It gets, it, if it can't kill it or eat it, um, it, it does something else, which is encapsulate it. So um, it's called fibrosis. And what happens is, basically, your immune system starts to cover these things with scar tissue. And so picture a sphere, uh, and you have your living device inside, and it gets wrapped up in scar tissue and basically starved to death. And so even though it could work for several weeks, it didn't last forever. And actually, uh, there have been human studies and this is actually a picture from a report in 2009 where they took these alginate beads filled with islets, um, put them in people. And what you can see uh, is inside the abdominal cavity of the patient, there are these little teeny spheres. But they're actually buried in scar tissue. So you have these little pancreases trying to do their job. And they're wrapped up in scar tissue and suffocated to death. And so I think where we are generally today is there's just really tremendous proof of principle that, that potentially we can make an, an artificial pancreas of some type. We can potentially protect it from the immune system. And there are actually a lot of studies going on with different kinds of materials and alginates and different formulations. People are trying to get this to work. Even today, there are, there's a, a variety of efforts. Um, and one of the efforts, I just want to talk about some of the stuff that we do, is on the material side. We think we can do better than seaweed. We think we can uh, make some new kinds of materials. And so I thought I would start off, or maybe end, with just a description of how scientists think about making new biomaterials. And so just for background, you know, when scientists and doctors first wanted to make medical devices, and they had to build something, they naturally went to things that they already knew. So the doctor's making an artificial heart. So, well, it's got to have a good flex life, right? It's got to beat. 
So in fact, the first artificial heart is made of the same material as a lady's girdle, polyethylurethane. Oops. Um, dialysis tubing is made of the same material as sausage casing. Uh, vascular grafts, there was a surgeon in Texas who wanted something he could sew with. And so in fact, the first vascular grafts were made of, of, of clothing, Dacron. And so, you know, this trend really, uh, really led to some pioneering advances early in medicine. But it also became clear that these off-the-shelf materials weren't always perfect. And so, for example, that lady's girdle material, if, uh, it actually has a great flex life. So it does that. But when blood hits it, it can clot, and those clots can go to the brain. And so over the last couple decades, there's really been a revolution in biomaterials. So now instead of sort of using existing materials, scientists are actually sort of sitting down and thinking, you know, how do I actually build this thing better? And so we're in the process of trying to do this for transplanted islets. I wanted to give just one nice visual example of a biomaterial from MIT. These are biodegradable sutures. So if you've ever been in an accident and the doctor's sewing you up, uh, you, you may have had a biodegradable suture. So on the left, these are shaped memory sutures. And so basically when you shift the temperature from room temperature to body temperature, they take on a new shape. So on the, on the left, we have a suture turning itself into a screw. And on the right, we have a suture that ties itself into a knot. Um, and so putting you surgeons out of business. Um, but this is just a nice visual example of how rationally designed biomaterials really have made great, great strides. And I'm very optimistic that uh, including in, in this field of, of uh, 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 transplanted uh, islets and artificial pancreas, uh, that we can make an impact. So I wanted to end early, uh, thanking some of my many uh, smart friends who I'm privileged to work with. So uh, we've been able to work with a lot of smart people, uh, both at MIT and uh, Harvard uh, and UMass. And it's one of the reasons I'm confident we're going to be able to have an impact in this area. So thank you. <laughs>